then F attains its minimum and maximum on AB. In other words, there are x1 and x2 in AB such that f of x is bigger than f of x1 and f of x is smaller than f of x2 for all x in AB. So this has a lot to do with the question of knowing whether the greatest lower bound or the least upper bound is in a given set. Okay, you know that in general, even if these numbers exist, they are not necessarily in the set. So here we are saying that for a function which is continuous, and it's very important to have a closed and bounded interval, so an interval of the type A, B, where you, you are including A and B. And of course, we need to have continuity. Then you can't find x1 and x2 in AB. And f of x1 is the minimum of f, and f of x2 is the maximum of f. Okay? So not only we are saying that our f is between two numbers, but we are saying that the two numbers are in the range of our f. Okay, it's much stronger than simply saying that f is a bounded function. Because bounded function means that I'm between two numbers. Fine. Here I'm a lot more precise. I say, well, I'm between two numbers, but the two numbers are reached okay, by f. So how do we prove that? It's, uh, the proof is interesting because we're going to use a number of uh, things that we have done already. And actually, uh, there are several steps. The first one, step one, is to show that f is bounded. Okay, which again is a weaker result than what we wanted. So f bounded means what? It means that what we want is to show that there exists M such that f of x is less than m for all x in AB. Okay, that's what we mean by a bounded function. It's very similar to our definition of a bounded sequence. Remember, a sequence is bounded if you take the absolute value of an, and it's less, there is a number for which uh, the absolute value of an is less than m for all n. Of course, here, the variable is denoted by x, and you are not dealing with naturals, you are dealing with reals, but it's the same idea. So that's what we want. By contradiction, we do proof by contradiction. We say that for every m, there is x such, uh, there is x in a, b, such that f of x is bigger than m. Okay, saying that f is not bounded is to say, well, whatever number you pick, <coughs> there is still a possibility for your f to be over it. 
Now, uh, just for notation, it's going to be useful to construct a, a sequence here. So instead of uh, calling this guy m, we are going to say for every natural n, and then the x is going to be xn, because for every n, we don't necessarily need the same x. And anyway, even if it's the same, uh, it's going to depend on n. So we would have this. Okay, just for convenience, we usually use n as our index for sequences. That's why I want to change my notation and say that it's actually for every n that there is an xn such that this happens. Okay? Okay. Now we have a sequence xn in the interval uh, a b. So what what can we do with this sequence xn? What can we, can we say about the sequence xn? It's a bounded sequence. Bounded sequence that should ring a bell. Which one? No. Uh, convergence implies bounded, but bounded does not imply convergence. However, bounded implies what? Yes, boson Ver stress. Okay, so we have x x n in A B for all n, which means that x n is bounded which means by boson Verstrass that there exists a subsequence nk so that x and k converges. Converges to some L. However, uh, the x and k is between a and b. And as we know, when we go to the limit, the large inequalities stay large. And I well, we can do this like this. And so we know that our L is between a and b. And here is the point where the fact that we are assuming a, B closed is important because you, up to now we could have said exactly the same thing with, with strict inequalities. It would still be a bounded sequence. However, when we go to the limit, we get our L uh, not necessarily between A and B, uh, strictly between A and B. And therefore, maybe you, your uh, sequence is converging to something which is outside the domain of a function. And that would be a problem. Okay, so that's where we are using that uh, A, B is convergent. Now, since uh, F, uh, so F is continuous everywhere on A, B, which means that F must be continuous at L, because L is in A, B. Okay, and then we are going to say that absolute value of f is continuous at L. Why can I say that? Why why can I say that if f is continuous at L, then absolute value of f is also continuous at L? Composition. I'm composing f with the absolute value function. This is a composition of two continuous functions, therefore it's continuous. Okay? So uh, we can write this as being the composition of a function of absolute value with f. Okay? So continuous L at L by composition of continuous functions.
so f of x and k converges to f of l. Why? Why can I say that f of x and k converges to f of l? That's our definition of continuity. That every time we have x and k going to L, then f of x and k must go to f of L. <gasps> right? That's how we define a continuous function. So this is by continuity of absolute value of f at L. Okay, but we have our contradiction now. Uh, of course, we, it would be clearer if I hadn't erased it. But um, well, uh, on the other hand, by definition, we know that f of xn is larger than n. I think we have a large inequality. Okay, that's how we defined our sequence xn. Therefore, f of x and k is larger than nk. Because this is true for all n. And it must be true for a subsequence. So do you see the contradiction? If f of x and k is bigger than n k for every k, what does this tell me about this sequence f of x and k? It's not bounded, therefore it cannot converge. Okay, we have a contradiction. Okay, so f of x and k is not bounded. Therefore, it cannot converge. But we know it converges. That's what we, we proved here. Therefore, we have a contradiction. Contradiction. F is bounded. Of course, there are 14 small steps in this proof. But each step is easy to understand. And you should understand. Okay. It's not that important for you to get the whole picture, even though it's quite natural, if you think of it, because you, you contradict the fact that it's bounded. That gives you the existence of a sequence. You don't know much about the sequence except that it's between A and B, and therefore it's bounded. Bounded must tell you, oh, I'm going to try boson inverse stress. So that's, I mean, the, it, it's uh, really uh, a natural proof. I mean, we, we just uh, use what we have. But what's important is that you understand each step. OK, so that's our first step. You look tired already. <laughs> the second step is to show that we actually get the maximum and get to the maximum and to the minimum. So second step F attains its maximum. The minimum is similar, so we, we are just going to do the uh, the maximum. So how do we do that? Well uh, Again, a natural thing to do is to look at A, the set A, 
which is the range of f. In the test several of you, uh, we had a set A, which was the range of a sequence maybe, and several of you talked about a decreasing set, if the decreasing, uh, that's, uh, that's not defined, okay? A set is not decreasing or increasing. A sequence is, or a function is, but not a set. So, uh, this is the range of F, and what we'd like to show that f attains its maximum, we'd like to show what property on a. What what's our objective? It has a least upper bound, and the least upper bound belongs to the set. Then we'll be happy. Okay? We need to do two things. Okay. Why does it have a least upper bound? It's not empty, so give me a, uh, an element of uh, this set. F of A belongs to A, so A is not empty. And then, by what? No, it's not bounded by B because you're looking at the F of X's. You're not looking at the X's. This is what your set is. It's, you know, all the images. So it is bounded by what? Maybe not. Maybe it's a function that, you know, uh, the f of b is lower than... What theorem tells us it's bounded? Any argument. Just uh, why, why do we know it's... Uh, it's a bounded. It's bounded above. That's step one. We just did that. Okay. By step one, this is a bounded set. This is bounded above and below. Okay. So bounded above, and I cannot be more explicit than that because I just prove that there was a bound. I, I have no idea what the bound is. It's going to depend on f. Bounded above by step one. So fundamental property of the reals, a has a, a least upper bound. So how do we call it? Let's call it M. We have a list of bound M. Now, if you remember, when we have a list of bound in a set, we can approach this list of bound by a sequence of elements in our set. Okay? So we can, you know, there exists an xn, a sequence xn, uh, I shouldn't call it xn, there exists a sequence, well maybe I should reprove that, let's see. Uh, okay, so the, the thing is to say the following, for every, for every natural n, there is yn in a such that yn is less than m but bigger than m minus 1 over n. So actually it's bigger than that. Okay, we saw different uh, variations of this property already. Do you remember how to prove a, a statement like that? How do you prove that for every n you can squeeze an element of A between 
minus m minus 1 over n and m. And don't say by the density of the rationals, please. So do you remember how you do that? Well, you now say uh, Archimedes. I just have to that. No, it doesn't help you here. You can't flip so, it around and use Archimedes? No, what you do is you say m minus 1 over n is not an upper bound because this is the least upper bound. If it's not an upper bound, you must be able to find yn in A bigger than this guy. And it's more because it's an upper bound. Okay? So we have this. If we have this, then we know that this goes to m, and this goes to m. By the squeezing principle, yn must converge to m. So we know that we have a sequence in A that converges to our least upper bound. But uh, A has a particular form. A is the range of f. Therefore, your yn must be of the type f of xn. Okay? Because all the elements of A are f of something. So we define our sequence xn as being uh, f of uh, uh, yn is equal to f of xn. And we redo the same argument as before, because we, we don't have much to work with uh, here. Uh, xn is necessarily in AB. So it's a bounded sequence. And bolzano verstrass applies. So we say, OK, by bolzano verstrass there is a subsequence, the subsequence x and k that converges to some, so let's call it x2, where x2 belongs to AB. It's exactly the same thing as we did before. Okay, bounded sequence, bolzano verstrass it converges in the closed interval AB. And uh, by continuity of F, F of X and K must converge to F of X2. But f of x and k is also y of n k. Okay, that's how we defined our sequence x n. So uh, x, uh, uh, the, the same property is true for a subsequence. You are just skipping some terms, and you get the same relation between the y and uh, the x n. Now. What can I say about y and k? It goes to m. Exactly. Why does it go to m? Because yn does, and yn k is a subsequence of uh, yn, and therefore it must converge to the same thing. Okay? So that's because yn converges to m. So any subsequence of yn must converge to m as well. OK, so f of x and k converges to f of x2. And f of x and k also converges to m. There is a unique limit. I cannot have two different limits. Therefore m must be equal to f of x2. Okay, So our least upper bound is really in A. Okay, This shows that m belongs to A. 
which was our objective. So that proves the extreme value theorem. Uh, of course, for the minimum, you do something similar and uh, uh, and act, or you can use this result. You can use the fact that the function attains maximum, and then look at minus the function. The maximum of uh, f is minus. I should write that. Um, what am I saying here? That the minimum. So the minimum of f is actually um, how does Okay, you have a relation of this type where you prove that uh, your minus f has a maximum, and that proves that your uh, f has a minimum. Okay, well, maybe it's uh, it's just as easy to redo the argument with a minimum, with a greater slower bound. You you do exactly the same thing. Your sequence is going to be between m and m plus one over n this time, but you know everything else is going to be the same. Now, we need to be careful when we apply this theorem to check the hypothesis, as with any theorem. And uh, uh, the one example is f of x equal to 1 over x on 0, 1, let's say. So if we sketch the graph, on 0, 1, we get something like this. Okay, and so what what do we see here? We see that if x is less than one, one over x is bigger than one, because we know that x is positive, okay, and the inverse function is decreasing. And therefore, and this is f of one. So f at, uh, f attains its minimum at x equal 1. Okay? Now what about the maximum? No maximum. No maximum because it grows without bound. So what happened to the extreme value term? Is this a non-continuous function? This is why it doesn't work? It is continuous. It's because it's open here. That's where the trouble comes from. Okay, therefore, there is no guarantee that I have a minimum or a maximum. I have a minimum, uh, I can show it directly, but I don't have a maximum. So, no maximum. The extreme value theorem does not apply. since 0, 1 is not closed. Now, how do I prove that I have no maximum? What should I do to prove that I have no maximum?
Well, we, we, you, from the graph, you see that your function is not bounded. So just show that it's not bounded, and you cannot have a maximum if it's not bounded. Okay? So the function is not bounded, and in order to show that it's not bounded, well, you take a sequence that approaches the point where you're having trouble, which is zero. So you could, for instance, pick xn equal to 1 over n, and you pick 1 over n because you know that uh, the problem is at zero. So that's how you decide that you are going to pick a sequence going to zero. And we know that that's a subsequence of, so we can use that. Subsequence of? Of 1 over x? No, uh, you don't talk about subsequence of a function. It's, it's related, of course. It's, it's f of n, but that's not why I used it. Okay? So f of xn now is 1 over 1 over n, which is n. And therefore, this is not bounded. f cannot have a maximum. Assume that it has an upper bound and then prove that it doesn't? Oh, yeah. No, you can do it directly, but like this. So by now you, you should be convinced that this thing of just having one point where you have trouble can be enough to uh, break a theorem. Okay, so be, be very careful and very precise when you use a theorem that you are really checking over hypothesis. Okay, uh, so for us the definition of continuity is that, remember, if, so we say that f is continuous at a, if when we have an converging to a, then f of an converges to f of a. And that's what we'll be using most of the time. But for some problems, it's good to have uh, another definition, which is the following. F is continuous, so assume that F is defined at, on D. Assume that A belongs to D, then F is continuous at A if and only if. For every epsilon, there exists a delta so that if x minus delta, um, x minus A is less than delta, then f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. So maybe the first time I taught this course, this is the first definition I put on the board. And people were like trying to flee from the windows. <laughs> and it's actually not so bad, but uh, now I understand that uh, there needs to be some preparation to that. Okay, so why, why, what, what does this mean? So we are somewhere, uh, we have an A here, 
and our f of a is somewhere here. And uh, what we're saying is the following. Give yourself an epsilon, which corresponds actually to a, an interval here, around f of a. Okay, you see your, your f of x is between f of a minus epsilon, f of a plus epsilon. And what you want is to guarantee that you are able to find an interval around A, so that's going to be, that, that has length 2 delta, so that by the function f, you can put this interval in here. Okay, so you see why this is going to guarantee continuity? You are saying that it doesn't matter how small your interval around f of a is, you are always able to uh, find an interval around a that will fit inside your interval here around f of a. If you have a jump, that's not true. Okay, if I have a jump, or for if my function is not continuous, so my function is not continuous, I'm doing something like this, and then it, it jumps here, let's say. And this is, let's assume that this is our f of a. Then I can pick an epsilon small enough, smaller than the jump, so that my epsilon is here, and the interval I'm, I'm thinking about is an interval like that, and it doesn't matter how hard I try around a, I'm never going to be able to fit this interval here into this one. It's always going to be too big because if I do this, then this point is all right, but any point I take on the right here is going to jump here. And therefore, it's too big. It's not fitting in here. Okay? So that's why it's really the picture, uh, one, one other picture of continuity to do that. <coughs> yes? If we if we look at it like uh, x is a sequence, then it's basically the same thing as our other definition, right? Yeah, because you are saying that if your, one implication is clear. You are saying that if your xn is close to a, then your f of xn is close to f of a. Right. Yes. Now, uh, a little trickier is the converse to that. And we, we need to do both uh, both sides. Questions on this definition? It, it's really not that different from what we have been doing with sequences. In, instead of looking for a capital N, now we're looking for a delta. Uh, the delta must be strictly positive. That's important. Okay, epsilon is strictly positive. There must be a delta which is strictly positive. And uh, it's really, instead of saying, I'm taking my n large enough, I'm saying, well, I'm taking my x close enough to a. And then I'm where I want to be. So it's really the same idea. And when I was a student, there were some uh, crazy French uh, trend to, to make us learn all limits in an abstract form and they would all apply like you you had a general definition of limits and you could use it for your sequence your continuity everything but of course no one could understand what the abstract definition meant so it wasn't such a great idea but anyway I'm, I don't remember it so I cannot uh, share it with you <laughs> Okay, so proof of that. So what I want to do first is okay. So let's let's say that statement A
is uh, the first part for uh, every epsilon there is a delta so that if x minus delta minus a is less than delta then f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon and statement b is Uh, that for if a n converges to a, then f of a n converges to f of a. And we want to show that both st that these two statements are equivalent. So first thing we're going to do uh, is prove that non b. Oh, so I, I inverted my two compared to. So let's let's do the same thing as in the notes. Otherwise, maybe confusing. Sorry about that. So let's assume non B. Okay, that statement B is not true. How do I start? There is epsilon, which is positive, such that for every delta, uh, there is x such that x minus a is bigger than delta, and f of x minus f of a is bigger than epsilon. Okay, I'm contradicting b. So I'm saying that I can't find an epsilon so that it doesn't matter how hard I try to find a delta. Uh, I'm sorry, this is smaller than because we are, cont we are uh, negating the implication. We are saying that if this is true, then this must be true. The negation of that is to say, well, this can be true and this still not hold. Okay, so that's why we need smaller than here and larger than here. Okay, because we can pick any delta we want, we are going to pick a delta that goes to zero. We are going to pick delta equal one over n, for instance. So pick delta equal one over n. That's a valid delta. It's a strictly positive number. And then there is x, but I call it xn because it depends on what the delta is. So that xn minus a is less than 1 over n. And f of xn minus f of a is larger than epsilon. Now, xn minus a is less than 1 over n, which means that uh, I can squeeze xn minus a between 0 and 1 over n. 1 over n goes to 0, and 0 goes to 0. Therefore, we can say that xn minus a goes to 0, which is equivalent to xn minus a goes to 0, which is also which implies that xn minus a plus a converges to 0 plus a by operations on limits, and that's xn goes to a. Okay, of course, xn converges to a. That's because of the way we have picked our delta. However, what can I say of f of xn? Can f of xn converge to f of a. Yes. 
No, because epsilon is fixed. I'm never going to be closer than epsilon. Okay, so you you have well you either see it or you do a proof by contradiction. You assume that f of x n minus f of a uh, goes to zero, and you see it's not possible because you end up with epsilon negative, which is always a, ba a bad sign. And uh, or you you just can say that because of this inequality, f of x n cannot converge to f of a. So, we have found the sequence xn converging to a, but such that f of xn cannot converge to f of a, which means that f is not continuous at a. Okay, according to our definition, every time xn goes to a, f of xn needs to go to f of a. If that doesn't happen for even a single sequence xn, we know that our function f is not continuous at a. So this proves non-a. Um, am I right here? Yeah, this, this proves non-a. So what we have done is start with non-b. And we have shown that non-B implies non-A, which means that we have proved the implication A implies B. Okay? So what we... So we have shown non-B implies non-A, and that's equivalent to A implies B. So what we need now is to show that B implies A, but that's easy. So we need to show that B implies A, and what uh, we do is we fix an epsilon, And then we say, OK, um, take, uh, actually, yeah, we'll take a sequence AN converging to A. And because we're assuming B, for every epsilon, we know that there is a delta. such that if x minus a is less than delta, then f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. Okay, since a n converges to a, there exists an n so that if n is bigger than capital N, then a n minus a is less than delta. Why can I say that? Yeah, and what, the only thing I'm doing, I'm doing my epsilon equal to delta in the usual definition, that's all, which is perfectly fine. The delta is strictly positive, so I can do that. The reason I'm doing this is that then, according to what's written here, f of a n minus f of a is less than epsilon. Okay, that's what B tells me. Therefore, so this is true for n larger than capital N. By definition I have, of convergence, I have proved that f of a n converges to f of a, and I'm done. 
that's all I wanted. And therefore, f is continuous at a. You have that stir again. That's um, really the the only part that I'm that I'm not really understanding well is the proper ways to use subsequences and functions together. Uh, you, I mean, the the only most of the time, what's going to happen is that you have a sequence. And then you you want to use Volzan and Verstrass, and you find a subsequence that converges. And then you may need the function too. But these are really two different things. The the, the choice of a subsequence does not depend on your function. Okay? Then you you may have to do f of x and k and argue that by continuity f of x and k converges to f of l. But you you must separate the two, okay? And that's that's a mistake that many people do, where they they are really uh, confused between sequences and the functions. Uh, you need to keep those apart. I mean, of course, they are the same object mathematically, but they usually you use one you use sequences in one part of the argument, and then you use your function. You and don't you, you don't mix you the two. You input the sequence into your function as. Correct. Like x values. Exactly. Other questions? Okay, so let's stop here for today. <laughs>